Amen, amen. Jesus is the reason for the season. I don't know about you, but his birth means more than his death because there couldn't have been a sacrifice first if he didn't live to be born. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. I'm going to try not to be before you long. I can be a little long-winded, but y'all pray for me and pray with me. I'll first give an honor to God, to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and to the undeniable presence of the Holy Spirit. If you have your Bibles, I want to thank our uh, fellow cargo carriers of the Crew Cross of Calvary, to our pastor and first lady. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the shoulders in which this house was built and the personality of Dr. Henry Thomas. We thank him for his love, his light, his life, his labor. I also would like to just thank my wife. It's official. <laughs> and uh, trust me, she is my helpmate. She just sent me a text and told me, preach, baby. <laughs> and I'd like to thank my mother. Dr. Winnell Alexander Jordan, you did earn your degree in theology, so I reference and honor you. And thank you for your support and thank you for your love. I just want to talk for a little bit, if you would turn with me to 2 Corinthians. Thirteenth chapter and the fifth verse. My mama. I know that we are in the pipe vein of Christmas. But before we can recognize and acknowledge the sacrifice that was on Calvary's cross. God has led me to take a self-examination. And I think it's befitting as we end this year ushering into a new year on the horizon that we need to know where we stand, not just with each other in the house of God, but where we stand with God himself. And if you have it, say amen. amen. I'll be reading from the King James Version for your edification. And it reads as so. Examine yourselves. Whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves? That's an imperative statement, but it ponders a question. How that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. If we can bow our head. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this priceless, priceless privilege that you've allowed me and awarded me on this side of heaven, dear God, to speak to your people. Let the clarity of your word bring closure. Let the closure of your word bring confirmation. And let the confirmation of your word bring comfort. These things I ask in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I 
I would like to tag this topic. Check yourself. Mama. If I could use the ebonic vernacular, check yourself. Check yourself. Yes. In 1993, a solo artist in the pipeline of a newfound rap group genre known as gangster rap ushered a new style of hip hop on the West Coast, coming straight out of Compton. There was an undeniable awakening from a notorious lyricist that came out of one of the most controversial rap groups of our time known as NWA. Yeah. That group comprised of Eazy E, Dr. Dre, yes, MC Ren, DJ Yellow, and the one and only O'Shea Jackson, but you better know him as Ice Cube. He released a platinum hit single titled, Check Yourself. And it was from his third controversial album titled Predator. This featured also a New York rap group also that collaborated with him called Daz Effect. Yeah. It hit the top billboards, the hip hop and rap charts, while also reaching number 20 on the Hot 100s. Uh -huh. I see. There was an interesting hook though in the chorus of this song yeah. that caught my attention. And it acquiesced over and over and over again. And it went, check it and check yourself before you wreck yourself. Yeah. My brothers and sisters, I'm not here to give you a history lesson on rapology. All right. But I want to give you a prognosis on the outcome of your life before it takes a turn for the worse. We often want to judge others, but if we turn the mirror around and just take a look at ourselves, God is telling us, check it, check yourself before you wreck yourself. And I like the fact that you can hear God's voice in any and everything. Yeah, yeah. But there is another lyricist that came before our Ice Cube that I want to bring to the witness stand. His name is David. You know David, a man after God's own heart. You know David. The one who slew Goliath with a slingshot and a rock. You know David. David, the one that the all just couldn't stop running. And he said this in Psalms verse 26, verse 2. He said, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. I thank God that my daddy, when he taught me, he said, when you see and, that's a conjunction, means it's inseparable, it goes together. You have to wonder why even then, David said, examine me. But in right standing, he says, oh Lord. So I want to ask you, sometimes when we are taking a self-examination, now who are you talking to? Make sure that if you are a child of God, in the kingdom of God, doing the will of God, in the way of God, for the work of God, that you make sure that you reference the Lord. Examine me. 
I took a look at, at that word examine and, and that word examine comes from the Hebrew term and I don't want to mess this up but Lord help me right here Holy Ghost it's dekimos and that word dekimos means to try me uh, uh, um, test me um, um, uh, properly approve me um, th there's something that I find very interesting that in the automotive industry that they do what's called um, a, a, a test um, analysis because they want to make sure that before they stamp their seal of approval of the product that it goes through a series of necessary tests. The test of the vehicle is to ensure safety. The reason why the examination is so important is because before God sends you out that he approves you. God has to make sure that he has approved you. It's a pre-approval process. In other words, I can't approve you until I bruise you. You got to go through a bruise process. So they keep crashing these vehicles over and over and over again. If some of you right now are wondering why you keep getting bruised in your season, it's because God is taking you somewhere and before you go out, he needs to make sure that business is taken care of within. He proves himself over and over again in you. It's something about that he not selected you, but he elected you. Before there can be an, an election, you got to choose a candidate. I stopped by to tell you, church, I'm glad that God chose me first and I didn't choose him. But the fact that he made me his choice, it's only befitting that I make him my choice. So I stop by to ask you today, if you are being tested, prove yourself. Examine yourself in the Lord. He wants to know that not only I've accepted you, but have you accepted him? He says, acceptable. I hear Romans 12 and 1 says, he I beseech you therefore now, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, acceptable. I can stop right there because a lot of times we don't feel worthy. So I want to admonish you that whatever the vocation of your calling is, whatever you put your hand to work to do in the kingdom of God, don't worry about the call because he doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the call. Not only that he wants to prove himself in you and through you that you are acceptable, but I like this and it jumped out of me and it hit me like a turn of bricks. He wants to prove himself through you that he's real. Too often, the preacher, the pastor, Christians, we get a bad rap because we out there faking and shaking and we're not being real. Church, this examination is necessary because it wants to prove that God is real. So what God is really doing is he is unveiling to reveal to expose. Brother Preacher, what do I mean by that? He has to take off the essentials of you and reveal your nakedness of you. In other words, the real you is going to eventually come out. Jesus said, so a man thinketh that he is. 
There's something about the unveiling of something to be seen that be presented before Christ or before God. God doesn't want to just prove himself to the world, but he is a selfish God. So he wants to prove himself that what he created, he didn't create it in vain. So he properly tested. You think I'm lying? He called Job to the witness stand. There was a heavenly council meeting and Job wasn't even invited. That's many of our lives today. Because when we got the call, the first thing we wanted to do was run. I'm so glad that I ran until I got exhausted. Because I found out that God's love is inexhaustible. So the further I ran, the closer I got to him. He's too wide that you can't get around him. He's too high that you can't get above him. He's too deep that you can't go beneath him. So the only way that you got to come to him is you got to come through him. I thank God that he had me look in the mirror and take a self-examination. And I like the fact that even then that David had medical intentions for us. I did some studying and I thought reigns just meant dealing with the affection of your heart and your emotions. But it's something that's tied richly deep in into the Levitical priesthood. Yeah. Reigns is the kidneys. It's something about the kidneys that filters out toxins and poisons. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere with this. Your kidneys is located in your body. And if the kidneys are not functioning properly, that poison can be circulated through the blood throughout your body. If that poison is circulating through the blood throughout your body, it can affect your muscles. It can cause your muscles to have a temporary paralysis. Which means you do not want to come stagnant in your walk and paralyzed along your journey. If the body is affected and we're stagnant in our walk, then we can't acquiesce this passage of scripture where it says it's in him we live and it's in him we move and it's in him we have our being. God is not a dead God, but he is alive and risen God. There was something else that I saw about them kidneys. In the Old Testament, when there was a purification sacrifice, I found out there was different sacrifices. They took the kidneys out of the animal. Thank you, Lord, I'm teaching. They took the kidneys out of the animal because they used everything in that animal. They took the kidneys and they went before an almighty God and when there was a purification of atonement of sin, they brought it before God as a cleansing agent. The word of God is a cleansing agent. And I thank God that he wants to present us faultless. He wants to present us without blemish. And he uses the word of God to cleanse us so he can present us, pre-approve us, put his stamp on us, seal us, deliver us. I can go on and on. And he wants to present you faultless so that when we go out, they won't see you, but they will see him. To use the kidneys. It was a bloody mess. And they used the kidneys to remind us that the word of God purges us, cleanses us. But let me tell you why the kidneys were so important because there's another organ that's connected to the same passage of scripture. He says in my heart. The reason why the heart is so significant 
Because even though this blood is still being pumped in our bodies, it's going to the brain. And it's telling the brain and sending messages to the heart. And it's telling the heart to keep pumping. Keep pumping. Because you gotta stay alive. Because the blood gotta circulate. The heart. The heart can't become contaminated and can't be poisoned because this can cause heart issues which could cause heart problems which eventually can lead to heart failure. Oh my God. If you don't understand why the brain and the heart works together, because if that blood is not properly circulating to the head, it can't, it can't give messages to the heart. What am I saying? I'm glad you asked. Brother Preacher, I'm saying that if you don't listen to the head, my God, if you don't listen to the word of God, if you don't listen to where the word of God is coming from, the head, when it pumps blood to the heart, you're going to end up with heart issues. Then you're going to have a heart problem. What are those problems? The medical industry, they call them symptoms. What are these symptoms? Jealousy. Backbiting, lying, stealing, killing. You don't necessarily physically have to have a weapon to kill your brother. You can assassinate their character and ruin their reputation by the words that come out your mouth. Be careful about the words that come out your mouth. Touch not my anointing, do my prophets no harm. Watch what you say. The head and the heart, they're one. Be careful of the words that come out your mouth. This is the prognosis. In other words, these are the series of tests that the doctors run based on the symptoms. But the reason why it's called a prognosis because they're trying to determine what your ailment is. God already did the prognosis. The prognosis was seen. And the prognosis reared its symptoms. And because it showed its symptoms, God had to prescribe a remedy. A cure. A prescription. So he sent Jesus. Doctor Jesus. Why find the healer Jesus? Because he had to prescribe a cure to handle our ailments because it turned into a sickness, a, di a disease, and it started infecting us. But I'm so glad that God gave me a shot of his Holy Spirit. What is the prescription? I'm glad you asked. The prescription is love, joy, peace, temperance, long-suffering, meekness, gentleness, kindness, tenderheartedness. And it's something about that scripture that wraps himself up in flesh. And he came through 42 generations to let us know that I love you. I love you so much that I had to try you because I needed to know if you love me like I do. And if not, guess what? That's okay. The fact that I took your sins 
upon me. That's called propitiation. He took our place. But the fact that he wanted to revive us because we was on the operating table dying, it's called regeneration. That changed my nature. But the fact that he wanted to set me aside and use me, that's called sanctification. That changed my character. But the fact that even if somebody tried to remind me of my scorn past, he said, you're justified. That's justification. That changed my standing. And in case if somebody think that you're a bastard child, he adopted us by the spirit of adoption. So that's adoption. And adoption changed my course. But the fact that I was on the dying bed on my way to hell, Jesus died on Calvary's cross so that I might live. So he saved my soul. And that is salvation. I'm done. I didn't have three points, but if you just need points, I'll give them to you. The fact that God pulled us in the courtroom and legally tried us. I didn't only have a prosecuting attorney that said I was guilty, but I had a defense attorney that said, let him go. And the fact that he put us in the law and we were judged and condemned, but the fact that he justified us with compassion. His mercies are new every morning. And I'm glad that he was faithful enough to wake me up this morning to deliver this message to you that this is the letter of love. And this is the law that we should preach. This is the law that we should teach. This is the law that we should live. This is the law that God gives us that we walk by faith. And as we walk by faith, that the just shall live by faith. As we live by faith, we should work it out by faith. And I'm so glad and thankful today that God gave us a Christmas. Because there's no Christmas without him and I'm so glad that he was born because he came to give himself for the atonement of my sins for the sake that I might live and come out of darkness into the marvelous light on the hill called Calvary that is the true Christmas tree it looked ugly they decorated that tree. And it's interesting that they hung a tree on a tree. And they decorated it with ornaments of hate. But guess what? He replaced it with love. They decorated it with unforgiveness. But I'm so glad that he said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And I'm glad that he hung that tree up for everybody to see for it to shine bright and it wasn't a silent night because the angels came out and they said peace on earth goodwill toward all men so I want to give you God's goodwill I want to give you God's peace and with that peace you take that gift that keeps on giving and you give it to a dying world they, they, they nailed his hands with a nine inch spike. They nailed his feet with a 12 inch spike. They pierced his side and out of his side came blood and water. The blood was to cover my sins. The water was to wash it away. And I'm so glad that God brought me by to tell you to check yourself because he checked everybody on Calvary's cross. And if you want to go where he is, check yourself before you wreck yourself. He don't want you to die. You shall live and not die. But that's not how the story ends. He got up with all power in his hand. Got up with all power in heaven and in earth. He got up with Deuteronomy's power, healing power, sanctified power, Holy Ghost power. Thank you, Lord, for your power. Your power for me to act right. Your power for me to talk right. Your power for me to live right. I thank you for your power. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. God bless you.
And may God keep you.